and the foals fat on the fat and fibre diets were much more investigative. You know, they're more curious and they're braver and they wanted to go and approach unfamiliar objects. Welcome everyone to episode 92 of the Send Nutrition Podcast. You're with your host Brian today and I have a very special guest and on the line is Dr. Andrew McLean. How are you, Andrew? I'm very well, thanks. How are you, Brian? I'm very good. And if our listeners are unaware who Dr. Andrew McLean is, he is very well credentialed. He won the highest Australian Science Award, the Eureka Prize for Science. He has a PhD in equine cognition and learning, Bachelor of Science in Zoology. He also is a co-director of Equitation Science International, ESI, and he's actually represented Australia in inventing and has been an accredited coach for more than 30 years. So we're in good company today. And what we will be going through today will be research and evidence of how particular nutrient profile, namely fat and fibre, can influence the behaviour of a horse or the mental health of a horse. And I'm really excited to discuss this with Dr. Andrew today and also give our listeners training tips and a real good insight into the physiology of a horse. So firstly, how did you pull up from Equitana? Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I thought it would be a bit of a fitter this year, to be honest, because of the um, you know inflation and the economic climate. And I think uh, in terms of the number of stands, it wasn't as big as it has been because I've been at every Equitana since 1998. Wow. So the number of stands were down, I think, but there's sort of a more diversity of um, things that are being sold. Um, and in terms of the people, um, as I mentioned, I think we had quite a lot of people. The first day was surprising. Normally the first day there's hardly any because it's midweek. Yeah. But actually we had quite a lot of people and uh, all the way going through the weekend. Not a huge amount, but a steady flow. Yeah, it's a nice contrast to Sen, which was our first Equitana, and we we were like kids in candy stores. We just you know, we were amazed by the amount of people, especially on that first day. And this is how we met, Andrew. And I think you were having a break from your stall. Yeah, that's right. I was I thought I'd just have a, a quick break and go for a walk. And I came across your stall. And um, actually, I caught the eye of somebody in your stall who had um, I had taught some years ago. Oh, Lisa. And yeah. yeah, Lisa, and so um, we got chatting, and that's how I got to know what you're doing. But also, I'm um, just thinking back now. I also saw you had a pyramid on the wall, a basic hierarchy of what's necessary for horses nutritionally, and I was pretty impressed with that pyramid. And that's what I said to Lisa because at the bottom of it, it had. Uh, hay and fibre, and that's not usually something that you see in feed companies pushing. You know, they usually talk about their own feed, but this was a really like an important basis because it is for behaviour uh, as well. Um, it's you know, the foraging behaviour in a horse is really vital to its mental welfare. It's not just nutrition; it's actually the act of munching and seeking for food. You know, even with slow feeders, just fiddling about and doing food things with their lips satisfies that drive. And if they can't do it, then they're much more likely to do things like wind sucking or any other stereotypical, oral stereotypical behaviour. It's very much related to the lack of fibre. We know that for sure. There's heaps of uh, documented evidence um, in the peer-reviewed literature on that. And we will touch on a, on this evidence. And we found really good common ground, you and I, in terms of looking at the whole setup of a horse's feed program. And yes, as a feed company, we promote fibre or unlimited roughage in the form of hay and pasture. And looking for those low sugar and starch sources of roughage should be the foundation to promote better behaviour. And there is crossovers in what Dr. Andrew and what Sen do in terms of looking at the horse's physiology and then assessing from there to really take a whole view of the horse and try and help every aspect and what we want them to do in their life and what they're being trained to do and really help promote that. And that, that starts with good behaviour and that whole digestive system and that gut-brain axis 
is is where it can be influenced by good feeding foundations. You'd agree? Yes, totally. Uh, yes, so I think the important thing to recognise is that although in the last few thousand years since we've domesticated the horse, and incidentally the horse is the most recent animal in domestication and, um, compared to dogs and other animals, so we, we've been uh, tampering with their genetics for about 5,000 and so what we've done, we've changed the way they look and their, their, you know, their size and their strength and all of those sorts of things. But we haven't really changed much in their brain wiring. Um, probably the only learning process we've changed is habituation, you know, because we made them tamer. We selected for tameness, basically, which is calmness, essentially, and, and, and being interested in people. And we selected for that. So domestic horses are much tamer. But other things we haven't, so their needs in nutrition are just the same as they always were. And horses in in uh, their original habitat, which was the steppe lands of Eurasia, so stretching right across uh, from China to um, to Western Europe, were, were generally pretty uh, re- depleted. In the you know there were vast grasslands and shrublands that was the, the the natural habitat of the horse, not forest and, and rich grasslands, but dry grasslands and shrublands, and they're just not made to eat carbohydrates. Mm. And, of course, they will. Most animals will. I mean, people feed carbohydrates and grains to dogs and cats as well. But like them, horses are made to eat those. They, of course, they eat a few seed heads when shrubs and grasses are, are flowering. But in general, they're really really rely on roughage and being a hindgut digester, they really need that. And um, elephants are the same. They're a hindgut digester and they have similar problems to horses. We'll touch, yeah, on, so. <laughs> we'll touch on the elephants later on too because um, that's very fascinating, your studies into, into them. And as we do know, a horse naturally or has evolved to forage approximately 14 hours a day. And this has a big impact on their mental health because that whole microbiome, it really is influencing their physiological processes and then also in terms of handling how they they take to stressful situations, it can be influenced by the balanced profile of nutrients going into that, um, that whole digestive system because, as Dr. Andrew just touched on, carbohydrates, they are digested in the small intestine but the fibre, the fibre sources of carbohydrates are, are fermented in the hindgut and promoting better hindgut health rather than focusing on the small intestine for nutrients is way better for their hormone production, their immune system, but their overall health in, ter- in terms of influencing behaviour. But I'm fascinated with your work, Andrew, in terms of studying horse behaviour and their physiology. And I have been reading that a horse's memory compared to ours, a horse has a better mem- memory than humans? Yeah, it has a very different kind of memory. So it has a much more photographic memory. You know, I think if we had a competition between uh, what they recall about their environment, their immediate environment from one day to another, uh, w- with us, I think we'd lose out pretty badly. <laughs> and partly that's because because horses don't... <clears throat> and, um, putting into quite simplistic terms now, but because horses don't reason as we do, what reasoning involves is constantly interacting with your stored memories. And every time you interact with them, like, you know, that's what we're doing now when we're talking, I'm working on stored memory. And every time we talk about those memories, depending if it was, you know, high value or low value, you know, rewarded or punished, um, it goes back into storage somewhat differently. And that's true. That's why human memory is so unreliable in courts <laughs> that uh, you know you can have twenty people who were um, there at the crime scene, and um, they've all they all source things slightly differently. But horses have a really super clear memory. So horses recognise if the bucket is not quite in the same place outside the stable door when he walks out, and will shy at that. Horses memorise even the um, the 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 sort of marks and the um, architectural aspects of the arena where they work. So even I know we put in fire extinguishers 
when um, I was director of the Australian Equine Behaviour Centre, because we had that's where the fires began in uh, in the two thousand nine, or just near us, and then came to us. And um, so after that experience, we put in fire extinguishers, you know, big fire reels inside the arena on the walls, and um, horses that hadn't been to our place for a couple of years shied immediately at those, and they they noticed the difference. So they do have this uh, great memory, which makes you wonder what they actually know that we don't know, you know, that we've mm-hmm. forgotten or that we haven't taken any notice of because we're too busy being clever. It's absolutely fascinating. I, I, I find it every part of the horse that we study just blows my mind. And what we're trying to do is is trying to influence this in a very positive way by understanding how they are naturally born or genetic makeup and then going with that. And that includes the flight response, you'd say, too. Yes, absolutely. And so the flight response is there in all horses. It's sometimes harder to trigger in a really quiet horse. Um, but I think in all horses, there's always some trigger that potentially could induce it. And that's why people are often very surprised that their normally quiet horse did show this particular reaction. And that that's really strongly wired because it's been such an important element of survival because when you live in the open grassland, the one thing that's for sure, and that is your your predators know where you are all the time. Whereas if you're in the closed woodland, they don't. They've got to find you and you can be hidden. So that's influenced horse evolution and that's why horses have the largest eyes amongst vertebrates or um, as large as any other eye in vertebrates and why they have the extraordinary kind of vision they have, um, especially instead of having a circle at the back of their eye like we do, full of dense, packed retinal cells, they have a visual strip. So they see all of the horizon equally, and they don't miss a trip there. And um, their sort of peripheral vision is above and below, not around like ours is. And their hearing is fantastic, especially high-frequency hearing, which is unusual for a large animal. Large animals usually have a better at lower frequency hearing, like whales and elephants. But the horse evolved in the open grassland where low-frequency noises are not much use, but high-frequency ones are because they're the noises of cracking twigs and sneaking predators. So they're just designed for that, and their flight response is really the icing on the cake that enables them to very quickly detect something through their senses and react in a lightning fast kind of way. And it has a whole suite of behaviours. It can range that flight response from mild in levels of of arousal right up to blind panic where they'll run just so fast, so hard, they'll even run into things. And many, many people have seen this kind of irrational flight response show up in horses where they damage themselves. Yeah, wow. And what we're looking at is evidence of dietary management. Can that influence the flight response in a horse or the flightiness or the anxiety in a stressful situation? Yeah, well, that's the thing. It absolutely does. There's just oodles of evidence now. Um, I, um, in just lo- looking at this, in, in uh, the textbook that we wrote, Equitation Science, we found um, seven peer-reviewed articles that show that um, there's increased flight response behaviours and stereotypical behaviours and other health problems arise from high-starch diets because of the high glycemic response, you know, in other words, increased blood glucose concentrations. And it, it causes high reactivity in horses. So there's one study that showed that foals, um, which is an interesting study because doing with foals, they're not... Um, you know, pre-trained or, or um, uh, coached in any kind of way for their result. But with this study with foals, but on starch and sugar diets, they're much more uh, reactive than foals fed on fat fibre diets. And the foals fed on the fat and fibre diets were much more investigative. You know, they're more curious and they're braver and they wanted to go and approach unfamiliar objects and unfamiliar people and the novel object tests that have been done where, you know, you expose horses to novel objects. Horses do much better on those when they're fed on a high-fibre, 
fat diet rather than a, a carbohydrate diet. And so there's all this hype in the horse feeding industry about, oh, we've, you know, we've micronized it or we've um, done this to it. It's rice, therefore it's not, um, you know, has the same characteristics as oats. Yeah. All carbohydrates do it. That's what they're made of. Uh, carbohydrate, any carbohydrate, any grain, that's what it will do. So it, it is problematic. It, it is, as I said earlier, something they're not adapted for and it increases their re- reactivity. So you're much better off without that kind of, um, that really high starchy carbohydrate diet if you're looking for a horse that's somewhat calm. Yeah, 100% right. Because when you look at, the companies that are micronizing, which is termed like a high heat treatment of starch, they're doing it so it's easily digested, but the starch level is still there and that's going to promote yeah, a negative behavior profile. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, all starch breaks down to sugar. That's what it does. Yeah. And um, so the sugar is really the, the problem. And it's a problem in humans too. We know that with children that people often say, well, I'm, um, you know, I don't feed sugar to my kids, but then they turn around and give their horse, you know, oodles of um, of starch, yeah. and then wonder why they can't ride it. Yeah, and here at Sen, that's why we have the feeds that are the lowest starch levels on the market. So less than one percent. They're grown. The base ingredients are grown in Western Australia, and we pride ourselves. We don't have ten, twenty different bags of feeds. They're horses at the end of the day, and we want a low sugar, low starch, high fiber profile product that is then supported with a good fat source that is high in omega 3 or plant based omega 3 that mirrors the omega profile of fresh pasture. So it's music to our ears to hear Dr. Andrew reference significant amount of evidence that suggests that our profile that we feed at Sen does have a good influence on behaviour and especially in young horses. That's right. And it's been known for um, over 20 years the bad effects of low forage diets on time budgeting in, in, uh, and the health of horses. You know, their, their time budgets change and um, they become much more restless and that's been known for years. And, and then more recently um, the effects of increased starch loads on restlessness and gastric ulceration as well as behaviour has been highlighted by, um, I think I have about five uh, peer-reviewed papers on that. So, and there's still more more, more to go in understanding uh, all of this, but it, I think it, the writing is really clearly on the wall that you know, people should do as much as they possibly can to avoid the high starch diets. I, I um, in the diets of the horses that I have, I feed them a ha- which sounds a little bit contradictory, but I feed them a handful of oats. Yep. But the reason of whole oats, but the reason I do that is because I am. We have a big population of cockatoos here, and so when I feed the horses, all horses get just a handful of oats. It doesn't not enough to make a difference to their behaviour, mm. and actually the oats come out whole. You know, um, because. I'll, if anything good has been sucked out by their um, gastric juices anyway, I suppose, but the, the, the cockatoos then go through the manure and I don't ever have to harrow. <laughs> um, it really, really helps. So I'm not a believer in collecting poo. I just think that's really bad pasture management because you ultimately mm. deplete the paddock and you can see it in the, those places where they do collect manure and sell it on the side of the road. Their paddocks are quite depleted because basically they're selling soil. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, all. that's cool, Dr. Andrew. So what I've commonly been asked is when we, when we promote a fibre-fat diet over the sugar and starch diets, some people say, well, a horse doesn't have a gallbladder, so why are we feeding them fat? And yes, that's true, but they need that gallbladder for bile, but the horse actually transports its bile by the biliary system directly to the small intestine. So they don't store the bile, but they do have access to it. So it's kind of a mis- right. yeah, so it's a bit of a misunderstanding that horses can't digest fat. They can really digest fat really well. And there's plenty of research that suggests up to twenty percent of the diet can be that depending on the level of work or competition. 
But that's right, and it's a feedback mechanism too. That you know, the, the, uh, to break down fat, you need lipase. I think it is. Yes. Yeah, that, yep. and um, and the more uh, those lipase enzymes that are produced because of, as you have an increasing fat diet, the more the more that gets produced. So yep. you know, it's um, they're very adaptive for digestive systems, and horse digestive systems are. Are adaptive, but they're slow adaptive. So that's why any changes you make to diet should be gradual and slow, because it's not like horses suddenly migrate from one, you know, to the tropics <laughs> where everything's different. So, um, but you know, in all their migrations, they really just are chasing in their evolution, just chasing grass, woody pastures, and and sh- and sh- shrubs. You know, it's a mistake to think that horses purely a grazer too. They are. Their history is of um, browsing as shrublands as well, and some of their ancestors actually, um, like Mary Hippus, for example, was actually a browser, not a grazer. Mm. And um, it makes sense that they do that, and that's why horses all eat your trees and whatever. It's not people say, "Oh, he must be lacking something if he's eating trees," but and no, he's actually adapted to eat trees as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's inbuilt um, in in the way that they they're made up and. Just going back onto the fat part, when a horse is trained, it's nearly about three or four weeks when you include a higher fat ration in the diet um, that their that their body does adapt to the digestion and, and utilization of that as energy, and it, it's quite energy dense and it doesn't promote negative behavior, and that's why we promote our sen oil as a nice healthy source, high in omega three, as compared to the cooking oils that we're traditionally use like the corn or rice bran um, or the sunflower oil um, we want we want to promote more plant-based omega-3 in the diet as that's what they've evolved on in grass and adding it fresh is the only way because it can be unstable when exposed to heat or light yeah that, that makes huge sense huge scientific sense to me because that that is so important to get those omega-3s but also, just from the basic biochemistry of what a carbohydrate is and what a fat is, if you think of a basically a carbohydrate is like a, a ring with, and it's a, it's in the carbon bonds where all the energy is. That it's basically within the bonds that that glue carbon to other atoms, and so smashing those bonds because they're so resilient, that liberates the energy. So a carbohydrate is, is like a, a ring of um, with a certain amount of carbon in it, but, but fat is actually a ribbon of carbon. So it's um, a ribbon of you know, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But that ribbon has just got much more carbon bonds than the same amount of, um, of carbohydrate, and you, you don't get the, the sugar effect. So I found, for example, years ago in my three-day event life um, when eventing was a very different sport because it had a very, very, very strong component of of um, fitness involved. And what's, you know, um, long distance, of, of the word escapes, and what's, uh, endurance. Endurance. <laughs> and um, and uh, the diet I fed my horses was basically largely a fat-based diet and um, – you know, one of my little horses won call a three day event. I never had an unfit horse. And um, it was basically centered on plant based uh, fats. Yeah, amazing. And that certainly gives them enough of that slow release energy to, to do everything that they need to do as, a, as, a, um, as an athlete. Yeah, we yeah it's not agree. just that fat's going to put weight on them and make them fat. It's actually going to give them, um, it's a very, it's a brilliant form of energy. Yeah. Yeah. Promoting stamina. We're, what we've done to the landscape, particularly with our racehorse trainer diets that we formulate, is getting a lot better nutrient profile with higher fiber and higher fat to promote not only good health in the horse, but better performance uh, over longer distance competition. So, yeah, that makes that makes good sense. Um, it, and are you finding that race trainers are uh, coming into this idea yeah they're, they're very receptive uh the ones that want to listen and and work with us um because as we know every horse is individual some some are not meant to be athletes they 
like us as humans as well. We're not all going to the Olympics, um, but what we have to do is work with the horse that we have in front of us. And if we can have a profile that is much more even than the traditional sugars or the traditional high grain diets, it's going to be better for the horse. And what they're finding is they're using less medications in terms of treating other conditions that are arising. And that probably leads us into this next uh, part is we, we see ulcers in horses that are, it's rife through a lot of the performance industries, but we know that the bottom part of the stomach or the gastric environment can be influenced or the ulcers that occur there can be influenced by anxiety and stress. And Dr. Andrew, your work that comes in with behavior and training horses, if, if, if horse owners are better trainers, the horse is in under less stress and less anxiety. So that would make sense that they've, they've got less or lower risks of ulcers in the stomach, would you agree? Yeah, that's a hundred percent agree. Maybe one hundred and fifty percent because <laughs> it's, it's so valuable to realise that you know that the problem with horse training. This is where why I came into this um, area um, what, forty odd years ago when I first was thinking about this. My background then was a zoologist, and I was teaching biochemistry and zoology at the university in, in Tasmania, and. Um, I started to, but I also had my event horses, and um, I started really seriously thinking about um, all of those those elements of training and how it can lead to stress. Because, for example, I would uh, because I broke in a lot of young horses. Every horse I broke in, I would, uh, and I did it using the Jeffrey method, which I still do, and I love that method. It's really touchy feely, like you lay across them bareback and you sort of smother them with your body and. They really like it, and like, you never get bucked off a, ha- a horse when you do that bareback. In all of my experience with hundreds of horses, it's it's a really wonderful, wonderful method. And both my sons do this in uh, Warwick, Warwick does it in Europe, and Alistair does it here in Australia. Um, it's really uh, unfortunately not well known enough that kind of methodology. People are scared to ride bareback or lay across horses, but with doing all of that and then clear training so that all the young horses are pretty much the same, regardless of how they arrive even, they, they're calm to ride, and I would take them down to my water jump that I had for my event horses. And every breaker went through the water, and most were pretty easy to get through it. They'd look at it and say, oh, you know, I don't think so. And I'd say, yeah, you're going to go in this. Just put your foot in and just stand here and wait and then put the other foot in. And they might go backwards, and I'd say, yeah, you've got to go in again and put both feet in. They'd go in, and then I'd be trotting through it and all of that sort of thing. But then the horse would come back to me two or three years later saying he hates water, mm. and he never hated water when he was young. And it started to dawn on me, and I saw this in so many different contexts, that how much you can mess up horses by bad training. And, you know, because all the training that you do with horses fundamentally is based on negative reinforcement, which is not a bad thing. It's just about applying pressure, and when the animal gives a response, you remove the pressure. So the reins work like that. The horse learns to stop when you pull on the reins, when he's first broken in, and the good trainer, and they all do it well like that. I've spoken to Steve Jeffries and many, many of them that are really capable trainers. They know Warwick Schiller, they all know that, that you pull on the reins, the horse stops, and you release the pressure. Same with a head collar, teaching him to lead. And the same with your legs. When you squeeze him to go, you know you squeeze or give him a few nudges with your heels. He, he doesn't like it, so he moves. And when he does move, you stop. So he, he learns all these things by the removal of pressure. And then it becomes much, much more, as the horse becomes more schooled and educated, much more sophisticated. We can barely see the action of the rider in, a, in good circumstances and good training. But if people get that wrong... And it's really common in dressage because dressage is so complex and it's so full of also weird narratives and, and, and sort of smoke and mirrors kind of language that people don't understand what they're doing by and large and they may have rain contacts. And I've measured them in Europe, in the Netherlands, uh, 12 years ago with rain tensiometers linked directly in real time to my computer doing a clinic for the a Dutch uh, federation for their coaches, and the pressures of the reins 
just as the horses are going around in these elite level horses that are representing um, Netherlands in dressage, we're up to five kilograms, and that's a lot of pressure on a horse's wow. soft tissues of its mouth. And so no wonder they start doing things, and no wonder they start getting ulcers. And if those horses, and in fact they probably were, on high starch diets, now the problem's twofold. They're going to get more ulcers, and we know that, as you said, there are plenty of papers showing ulceration effects from carbohydrate diets. Yep. But bad training leads to the same thing. So the horse is in an impossible situation. And, and when horses have gut pain, they tend to do more bad behaviors. And there's quite a strong link between pain and bad behavior. So it's a, it's a horrible merry-go-round that uh, needs to be solved from multiple directions. Um, you know, and also horses that have to spend time chewing grain often have different teeth wear patterns and they need the dentist more often. And, you know, there's just so many points to this star of good horse management um, that, yeah, we can spend all day talking about it. There's, there's so many aspects. Uh, Socialisation is another big one, but I won't go there unless you want me to, but it is. A, <laughs> we might. There's other animals they need. And, yeah, and that's our role as a progressive nutrition company for horses so what Sen tries to promote is the foundations of horse feeding management in terms of that lower sugar lower starch roughage as the as the biggest foundation because as you touched on there the, even the chewing even the effect on the teeth if you've got a high sugar high starch cereal roughage or cereal based roughage like barley hay it's going to have an effect over time because they're chewing on this 13 or 14 hours a day. And I do have dentists or equine dentists call me up and said, I really share your podcast with all my trainer clients just to get them off that higher sugar and starch roughage because I'm seeing it firsthand in the stables with their teeth right in that training ground. And, and with ulcers, the studies and theories have changed in the recent years in terms of how exactly are they caused and what we do know is you've got the squamous area or the upper part of the stomach and then you've got the glandular region which is the bottom which is protected from the acid the upper part can be influenced by nutrition and so the and then the bottom is influenced by behavior anxiety or that sort of management or, or stress management so ulcers can occur at all parts of the stomach and if you get your foundations right, which is what Dr. Andrew is promoting and Sen is promoting, then you're going to lower the risk and then that is going to hopefully translate into a better performing horse. That's right. And then to make matters worse, um, you know, people then fix the problem by not changing the diet or changing the training, but just giving them ulster guard. And, um, and, and that, I think it's a miprazole, isn't it? Yeah, the that's right. yep. is um, now known to be um, quite deleterious for horses. So, you know, you, you just keep on throwing more band aids on a weeping wound instead of going back to originally fixing the problem. Yep, correct. You, you get your foundations right, then go from there. We're not against the medications; they are used and should only be used short term because we know the long term use can actually have effect on the bone structure of the horse. So lower absorption of calcium then the horse relies on the calcium from their bones which is not not a very nice thing physiology wise but if we can ensure that the horse has an ulcer friendly dietary management then an ulcer friendly training management which involves knowing the horse better creating less stressful environments um, then I think you're going to have be you're going to have a better advantage in the end with performance. Yes, absolutely. It makes so much sense to, to think of it that way. And I think it's um, never too late to change a horse's diet. Just You just have to do it you know, gradually over a few, you know, a, a week or so. That it, um, it makes such a big difference. And when I was director of the Australian Equine Behaviour Centre, when this uh, work of Christine Nichols came out, and she's one of the most outstanding behavioural scientists in the world and probably... Um, of the century, 
um, my last century in her work. She's really an outstanding academic and researcher. The work that she showed with uh, the fat fiber uh, diet effects on holes that you know improved their calmness and uh, and tractability and improved their inquisitiveness, which is what you want, because that's a part of training is actually animals being inquisitive in the sense of trying things, trying a behaviour instead of being afraid to try anything. And so I changed the diets of our horses at the Australian Equine Behaviour Centre to a fat fibre diet. And I'd say within two weeks I was completely on it because the horses, that, our caseload, we had a, um, generally around 25 horses at any one time that came for um, breaking in but also behaviour problems and sometimes sometimes quite severe ones. Those horses were really very different. And in fact, um, the owners changed the, their feed regime when they got them home to that fat fiber diet because that was, um, you know, really, really appreciated how much it worked. Yeah, that's all. That's awesome. That's a first-hand view of it. And we see it time and time again with, in particular, the racing stables. Some of them won't tell the tra- track work riders that we've, that they've changed to more fat fiber in the diet and they report they said is is there something you've been doing here with this horse it, it has a better temperament it's responding better to their work um seems a bit calmer and yeah that's we're getting that feedback continually because a calmer horse is going to perform is going to be w- more willing and, and perform better and it, it can be in any industry that it really can benefit getting a better nutrient profile overall as you said yeah that's right and um you know, and, that, and that's a blind study, so that's a good one. To you know, when the mm. jockeys don't know anything, change that they report changes that um, that's telling you a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 telling us we're on the right track, and I don't think we'd be here nine years later, um, still going and growing. And it's just getting horse owners understanding and aware aware of their individual horse, and then trying that transition, um, and then and then seeing the results and. Of course, every environment is different. Every genetic or genetic makeups of horses can be different and little adjustments have to be made due to the quality of the pasture or the hay that they can obtain. So we're, we're really happy to work with the horse owner and even on your side, Dr. Andrew, with your clients, how do you find them in their response to your way of training or and behaviour management? I have a pretty interesting clientele, I suppose, and it's pretty broad across the world, because we, I run a diploma course, we have 50% of our, I think more than 50%, just over, of our students, our past and present, are international students. So because of my work where I used to, before COVID, beginning uh, in May, I'd, I'd go to Finland and do a couple of clinics there and then work all my way down through Europe and end up in Switzerland a month and a half later, I had quite a lot of people, and particularly I worked at vet schools as well, so a really broad range of people who were really interested in knowing the science behind horse training and management, and they, they're they definitely, well, I wouldn't say converts, because that's what they were seeking to do in the first place, is just do the best that they could with all that we know in science, how can we do the best thing by these horses, and the same thing with their clients here in Australia, they're um, they're really they're already on board with it. They don't take much convincing. The convincing the ones that take a bit more convincing are the ones you just happen to meet, like at Equitana, if they're not really if they're just passing by, you know, because quite often they want to tell you their story about their horse and um, but actually you can when you start to talk to them and you unravel their story about what they're really telling you as opposed to what they think they're telling you, <laughs> then you can start to make changes because once things make sense, you know, if something makes logical sense, well, only a fool wouldn't listen. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's um, really good. I mean, in terms of the whole picture for the fat fiber approach to really work well, as you pointed out, it's the training that needs to be optimal. And you can train a horse right to the top level in dressage and win a gold medal on optimal training. It doesn't, you just need to know more about the finer points. And that's what I think the top 
trainers do do, and I've taught many of them, a few gold medalists as well, who really understood the, the basics of training, but in different terminology to the scientific terms that I use, but same thing, you know, pressure release, timing, making sure everything is totally on time, um, all of those sorts of things. And the aspects of management, not just uh, the foraging, as we mentioned, you know, the 13, 14 hours a day of, in that regard, if they don't actually eat hay for that 13 or 14 hours, they just need to be seeking and playing with something mm-hmm. that delivers hay. So racehorse people can do it. So instead of letting them gorge hay all day, give them, you know, really small, slow feeders that they yeah. can only pluck out one one uh, straw at a time, and that's still good for them because they're doing it. It's the actual, it's the mental activity of doing foraging, seeking that is the important part. The other aspect that really is the icing on the cake for your work and my work is actually socialisation because for years we've managed horses as prisoners mm. uh, in boxes and we think, well, it's really nice nowadays we've got bars in between so they can see each other but that's not enough they're creatures of touch and we don't know of any animal that is more intensely uh, tactile than horses to the point where horses have have a plexus of nerves in front of the withers that directly interact with the vagus nerve of the heart so when horses scratch each other there's a 10 beats per minute lowering of heart rate and wow. they do that whenever they're insecure because they meant that they're really insecure animals because of where they live, you know, where they evolve. But they're born insecure to be really wary because your predators can always see you in the open grassland and we've never managed to change that genetically. So they scratch each other uh, whenever they're feeling a little bit like needy, like a child comes to you when they need a, need a cuddle. Um, and they do that to each other. And furthermore, studies showing that when humans groom horses in those spots, there's also a 10 beats per minute lowering heart rate. Now, we've never seen that in another animal. So that would be the science behind positive reinforcement for a horse. The, the right way would be to rub or scratch the wither? Yeah, totally. It makes a difference. Yeah, just, like patting horses is just stupid and pointless and it makes people feel good and it makes the public shout and cheer but it doesn't do anything for horses. Um, at best, what they do learn after many, many years of exposure to patting at the end of a good dressage show, jumping or eventing or whatever performance, a big pat might probably means termination. That Well, mm. that's done. But it's not intrinsically rewarding because they don't pat each other, but they do scratch each other. And so just rubbing them vigorously on the wither is, make such a huge difference to them and I don't see why we can't make that easy change but I've been going on about this for years and people rarely you know take on that advice but if the studies do show that it lowers the heart rate that's got to be enough evidence to suggest that's the right positive reinforcement but is there any studies on say even with a positive voice like good boy or good girl There, there is um like a soothing voice makes them feel a bit calmer. That uh, there is some evidence of that, but and also the horse's hearing. Interestingly, the sensitive part of their hearing is at the similar frequency to human voice. Frequencies of human voice, so in men it ranges from eighty odd um, hertz to uh, and and women to um, up to two hundred. So they're very sensitive at those hearing ranges, which is useful. But it's just that for the voice command good boy to work when they're not, they either don't know language in the sense of the syntactical effects of it and all of those things, but they are very good at making associations because they're incredible memory and incredible learning ability. So if you always say good boy every time you scratch, good boy actually means it's loaded with good things. Or if you say good boy every time you give him a food treat, it means something. But if okay. you say good boy randomly, it means it begins to mean nothing because it's sort of like a currency, like in Zimbabwe, you know, where <laughs> a, um, a million 
dollars is now worth nothing. I think, yeah, yeah, there's no substance to it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You've got to pay up. Um, that's what I always say as a trainer when I'm teaching. You know, when you if you use a clicker for food treats or you use, or you scratch, and you say "good boy" as a condition reinforcer for scratching, you must pay up. You know, because sooner or later it'll start to wane, and it me- becomes meaningless if you don't pay up. The you cl- can do two or three in a row without paying up, but you, ca- you shouldn't go for too long. Yeah, yeah. And the click training has science behind it? Yeah, there's massive science behind that. Yeah, the um, conditioned reinforcers are, are huge. I mean, that's how you, they train dolphins and whatever in, um, in sea world. And, um, and basically, conditioned reinforcement is really what language is in humans when children first learn it. You know, you point to, you know, dad and you say, dad, dada. And very soon, that thing becomes the the reference of what data is, and and everything else in their life, and um, they learn it through classical conditioning, uh, you know, Pavlovian conditioning, where just any previously benign signal now comes to mean something. So a clicker soon means here comes food, but mm. you've got to pay it up if you click and don't give food it starts to wane and it doesn't really work effectively. But it's a very powerful and still a not heavily utilised tool in training and it really should be because it's got enormous benefits. The idea of a clicker is purely because it's hard to deliver food on time and in animal training, you have to be on time. You've got to be at the moment of the behaviour for it, for any kind of reinforcement or punishment for that matter to work. If it's not on time, right at the moment of what it's doing, it, the animal hasn't got the slightest clue what it was for. So that's really the biggest mistake in training is what, you know, punishment after horses is refused is a complete joke. Um, turning a horse won't give any good, you know, whack with a stick does nothing for its learning except it makes it more reactive on the show jumping arena. So probably now going into some flight responses, it's going to jump with it in front of it, but it's not an athletic way of jumping. It's more of a panic. Mm. Um, so there's much better ways to teach animals. So yeah, the quick condition reinforcers are valuable. And to my understanding, the horse does learn with pressure and deconstructing that in a science way, I think we did touch on it before, is that there is a right way and a wrong way with the pressure? Yeah, there is. I mean, see, when you're sitting on a horse, <clears throat> there are quite a lot of um, pressures that are delivered. Even with your own weight, you can alter the pressure of your seat bones, and very skilled riders do that, and they associate those alterations of pressure with something the animals already learn through some other form of pressure, like rein pressure or leg pressure. So reins for slowing or shortening or going down a gate, any decelerating kind of activity, that's what reins essentially do, and they're really, that's their fundamental meaning is about deceleration, and the fundamental meaning to the horse from its very earliest life, the fundamental meaning of leg pressure is going faster within the gate or longer in the stride within the gate or up the gate, you know, up to another gate. In other words, just accelerating. And so when the horse is really learning those, very soon the horse jumps ahead of you. So you you don't need to use a strong rein pressure to stop him. The horse basically says, the moment you touch those reins, I'll be stopping, and therefore you're obliged not to do any more pressure. So that's, again, the good timing. And now he's on light rein aids and probably light egg, leg aids if the trainer's really astute and good. And the horse goes from a whisper pretty much. And now he's really open to learn all of the other possible effects that the rider gives, like how he uses his body and weight and seat and posture. And, um, but that can only be learned if the horse is light. If he's, if he's heavy on the reins and dull from the um, leg, um, it doesn't, you know, he, he's not open to learn subtle things, mm. you know, because he's still in a state of uh, pressure and his arousal is too high. So the window of learning is shut. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. No, thanks. Thanks so much for for explaining that in real good detail. And I think our listeners will really appreciate all the insight that you're giving. And Andrew, what we'll do is we'll now go into a probably a common misconception about the social structure of horses and the hierarchy or said hierarchy about them. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit about this? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a really fascinating area because it basically came into our language about horses in the 60s and 70s. And the reasons it came into our language, this idea of a hierarchy and a really you know, a linear hierarchy of dominance um, and, you know, dominance and submission was because of a series of political events in the USA and scientific events in the USA, which you wouldn't think would be related, but they were. And it was because this new idea in psychology, known as behaviorism, led the guy who proposed it called Skinner to make some pretty outlandish claims where he his famous saying was he could... Once you understand learning processes, you can turn a peasant into a lawyer. That's what his idea was, and um, it's a and behaviorism gave us so much extra knowledge about learning, and that's really the, the essence of what I'm talking about with the way we use positive and negative reinforcement and conditional reinforcers and all of that. But because of that, if you can imagine that in the uh, fairly conservative political climate in the USA, they didn't like that one bit. Like, you can't go having peasants becoming lawyers. Mm -hmm. You know, that was sort of the thinking. So they really disparaged Skinner and all of the other behaviourists. And in the end, uh, after the 1960s, there were no papers presented in scientific literature with the words operant conditioning in them, which was the main aspect of Skinner's proposal, that operant conditioning is a great tool for learning once you know how to do it and psychologists use it and everyone did. Circus trainers used it on animals and it's everywhere. Horse trainers use it all the time. Dog trainers use it. But the word never appeared and psychology changed. And the idea, the the basis of human psychology turned into this um, approach. At that time, uh, the horse behaviorists in, or sorry, the horse trainers in America the, from where Pirelli started and people like that, we're also searching for language. And so instead of using the ideas of behaviorism, they chose the ideas of animal behavior, which is a separate science where they talked about um, animal hierarchies and animal groupings because there were some studies on chickens that showed a pecking order. Um, and this was back in 1921 and, and others continued to do that. And so what the horse whisperers proposed, or new age horse trainers or whatever we call them in the USA, they started to talk about this in terms of horses. And of course, it really appeals to people because we see these institutions that are hierarchically based. We're, you know, we're, we're involved in them, the church, the school, the military, you know, they're all basically a linear hierarchy where A dominates B, dominates C, dominates D, and um, you can't jump your space without getting trouble. And a guy called David Meck also proposed this with wolves because when they put a whole lot of wolves on Ile Royale in Canada and then started to study them, they noticed that there was a linear hierarchy there. But the big mistake in that, and David Meck really apologised for this, but nobody listened, was... But that's not the natural way, um, wolves, because wolves normally live in family groups. And the more recent studies of family groups in in wolves and horses have shown that the hierarchy is way more complex than what we think. It's more like a mosaic where A might dominate B and B might dominate C, but C might turn around and dominate A or B for a particular resource. So... All of these expressions of dominance were not only um, hard to map out in any of the, an impossible in a linear way, but also they were related to the actual resource. So an animal might be way more dominant for sex than, say, for food or for space. 
or the other way around, you know, just depending on the individual animal's um, tendencies and also depending on satiation. So if an animal's already got half a stomach full of food, it's going to be not too bothered if another dog jumps in beside it and starts eating as well. And so these ideas were uh, basically launched into the horse world incorrectly because what we do now say, the term we use is bilateral dominance, that every horse knows who he is dominated, who is, sorry, who he dominates and who he is dominated by for every particular resource. Mm. But the horse doesn't know uh, the relationships between the other horses because it's not important to him to know that. So this is, this is bilateral dominance and, and that's how it is in the dog world, in the wolf world as well. And it works in a much more family caring way because it means that everybody gets to go at the resources. Like if just the dominant ones got all the resources, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have the young ones coming up. And so we see that, the same thing we see in, um, in the big cat world where for those big cats that live in, um, in social groups like lions, the idea of a linear hierarchy actually only exists in humans, in, in the military and places like that and, and schools and whatever. And even then, uh, we're beginning to dismantle it because people realize, for example, in the workplace, that you get more productivity out of people if they're made to feel equal and if they're made to feel valued. Uh, not just by the old-fashioned way of putting them in their place and, you know, that sort of thing. So it's a really interesting story. It's a big change for me to recognize that because I used to think of horses in that dominant way because of my background in animal behavior back in the early days. And what changed for me was was actually a psychologist who, um, because they, they brought back this idea of behaviorism in psychology. It's now... An, more mainstream again where they understand about operant conditioning and conditioned reinforcers and all of that and the value of it and it's called behavior therapy and it's really effective and it's so effective that you can get rebates on medicare for it and so this i was teaching this girl in my arena years ago and um her father was a psychologist but i didn't know that and he was in his car near the arena with the window down apparently reading the paper but i don't think he was he was listening to what i was saying and I was telling her that her horse is dominant and she needs to make it submissive. And in other words, show it who's boss. So this was the old style of thinking. And um, and all her problems would be all solved. And um, her father came up to me at the end and said, so you think um, my, horse's daughter, my daughter's horse is dominant, do you? And I said, yes. And he said, what makes you think that? And I said, you know, well, I'm a zoologist, this is how I know this, you know, look, the horse walks all over her and uh, she can't even lead it in a straight line. He said, well, I'm surprised you don't see this in another way, like as just the failure of single learned responses. And I nearly fell over backwards this is before I did my PhD. It's almost what pushed me into doing it. Wow. And um, I said, oh, who are you? And he said, I'm Professor Kim Eng from, he was a you know, he's originally a Vietnamese refugee. Now, uh, his family were, and um, Professor at Monash. And he said, I'm Professor of Experimental Psychology at Monash. And I said, oh, wow, that's a very different kind of approach. He said, yes, you're a zoologist. You're like all zoologists. You think in that uh, way. And um, I felt pretty, you know, embarrassed. And he said, who are your supervisors? And I told him who they were. And he said, yes, but they're ethologists, uh, you know, animal, animal behaviorists. And I said, yes, I know. I said, I think I might need you on my team. And he said, yeah, I'd be happy to help. So every week for almost a year, I used to go to his place and get psychology lessons, like a really great crash course in psychology. And that's what led me and helped me. My PhD would have been vastly different had I not met that man. Wow. Because I would have still been in that world of, you know, show them who's boss maybe. Um, although it would have crumbled in the meantime, somebody would have crumbled it, but that was certainly my, how I got led into it and it changed everything for me. So he's, this guy said, well, why don't you just teach her then? If the horse walks all over it, why don't you just teach her to lead it straight and just start off with a single step? And I thought, jeepers, I can't really get paid for this lesson. He's telling me how to do it. <laughs> 
and anyway, so that that's how it all started. But it's yeah, it's, just, it's a different approach to the idea of you know horses being dominant over you assumes that horses see you as part of that clan, and we're not sure about that either. I think horses just do things to people because of mistakes that we make in training. That's the truth of it. And the, the world, as you know, these days is full of, it's not my fault. Let's turn the mirror onto somebody else or something else. We're very, very scared to turn the mirror around to ourselves and see that maybe it's a mistake that I've made that I could correct. But that is actually the only solution because if you can't change it and you think it's someone else's fault or the fault of the horse's nature, you know, he's just born a bad horse, then, you know, you're, you're stuck. What are you going to do? So it makes much more sense to turn the mirror and change what you do. Yeah, and control that variable you can control. And it's a credit to you to actually have the open mind when that, uh, that psychologist sort of confronted you and it's now led yeah. led down this this path for you and that's, that's an amazing story. Dr. Andrew? Yeah, it was really it was really confronting. I couldn't wait to go and tell my wife what had just happened and how I had this sort of major transformative moment of never I never I'd not even heard of a single learned response. But that's now what I do. I break behavior patterns down into single learned responses and nearly always in all my clinics and I'm I'm saying this after I'm confident to say it after so many years of experience in Europe and also I used to do clinics all through the USA and Canada and, and New Zealand is that um, if you break the horse, what the horse learns from us, you know, stop and go and turn, those three things, if you break down the components of those into the single elements of what it really is and go back to those things to repair behavior problems, it's almost in, always uh, the best cure you know, because people hold on to the reins too strong and the horse is now shortening his neck and he's tight in the reins. And, of course, mouth pressure used to mean to the horse when he was first broken in, used to mean to stop and slow. And ultimately, you would still always want that because if the horse is bolting, all you're going to do is pull on the reins. So it should always be there. But not not polishing it and maintaining it is really a big mistake. And the more you pull and the less he responds, the more you've destroyed that learned response, but also the more confused you've made the horse. And that leads to mental issues, you know, like he becomes really insecure. And the same with the go button. If he becomes really dull to the legs or or way too hot to the legs and you can't touch him, you've got to fix that too because all of those confusions, excuse me, they feed... um, They feed conflict behaviours and neophobia, which is afraid of new things. So those horses, it's why it's very common in high-level horses where they say, oh, well, you know, he doesn't like crowds. He can't stand clapping. You know, you can't even ride him to the medal medal prize giving. Um, He has to be led. This has been true. Some of the top horses in the world needing to be led to a prize giving, which is in dressage, like a bit ridiculous because dressage was supposed to be about training a horse for war, not not just a prize giving ceremony. Mm. You, you know, so we do so many confusing things to horses now and the fashions in dressage have changed. They're actually improving again now, which is good. They're not returning yet to what they used to be and what they should have been, what they should get back to, which is like it was in the 60s and 70s, I think, which was better for horses. Um, but it is heading more in that softer direction and horses are becoming, I think, a bit less confused and better trained. And do you see in the dressage landscape the feeding practices like the typical ones? Are they still using a lot of grain ration? Yes. It's just that they certainly are. It's just that they've got different names. So they <laughs> say, oh, no, no, it's, this one's not heating. This is actually... Um, this is not really a real carbohydrate. It's just, you know, it's... Altered. It's, yeah, it's, it's a carbohydrate treated in a different way. I say, yeah, but it's still sugar. Yes. It's still a sugar diet. You know, it's um, it's it's a problem. And um, they all that terminology that comes about, 
mean, it's through monetization of the horse industry. It's way more monetized than it ever was. You know, you just walk through Equitana and, mm. you know, instead of just being able to buy a blue canvas rug or a green canvas rug, you can buy body suits and all sorts of different things to put on horses, uh, different colors and fabrics and different bits and different bra. You know, like it's really monetized. And horses are money t- monetized too. You know, there's big money in mm. in um, selling horses. Yeah, and what we try and do at Sen is – simplify it right down according to the physiology of the horse and that's what we pride ourselves on and and no smoke and mirrors we have a also different to other feed companies in terms of fixed recipe so not a seasonal ingredient recipe which can change without you knowing if the if a company has run out of a particular ingredient we keep our formulas simple with the same ingredients all year round so as we touched on the microbiome has to adjust with different nutrient profiles and, and at Sen we keep a consistent profile and that's what we want to want to promote to have a better horse and better behaviour in performance. And what we're talking about today with Dr. Andrew just, just fascinates me but also gets me excited because we want to do what's best for the horse at the end of the day and we have so many crossovers with with what dr andrew promotes um it's just amazing to have you on the podcast yeah thanks i I love talking about it it's really interesting i really like to educate people and you know to lead them through the same discoveries that i've had in my life about horses that really trap you know i was once i learned this i was really it was impossible for me to go in a different direction i had to explore it more because it's just so so captivating and it's so valuable to know. Like I was a lot safer uh, as a horse breaker and a person riding difficult horses. I think there'll be many people who've possibly been to some of my clinics. You know, I held in four times a year, three to four times a year in every state in Australia and I rode probably more rearers than anybody else did. I would say definitely that's true in the 90s and uh, up at the, uh, to the until about 2009 or 10, and, um, you know, I never had any significant injuries except once I got bucked off and thrown into a wall and uh, and broke a part of my shoulder. But um, that was a, a horse that I didn't quite have the right information from the owner. I just got on it. Um, but, um, you know, I'm really fortunate that having all those years, you know, I fed my family for my breaking in um, work in the 90s, and, you know, we, we that was my main source of income. I taught at the university for 10 to 20 hours a week part-time um, after I left them full-time. I was only full-time for two or three years, and then I left and went part-time because I went breaking in. And I'm still sound, you know. I, I, I don't limp and have a, any leg or, or back issues at all, and it's all Amazing. because I've been so much safer by doing things a bit smarter. And I'm hoping both my sons are the same. So far, they're sound. <laughs> one's 40 and one's 30. Um, but I'm hoping that knowledge keeps them really safe. The time of this podcast is, is moving along now. What we'll do is we will probably finish off and ask you, back with the horses, what would be, say, one of the key training tips that you give? Do you, uh, in terms of training horses, I think... If people try to perceive and imagine from the horse's point of view and remove all the layers of humanistic thinking, just this animal, what is it learning and what is it uh, discriminating when we do all of the things we do? And often we will realize if we use enough brain power that actually it's a, a vast array of signals that the horse, that the horse is expected to know. Um, and does he really know them well? And how much? How much does he know all of his basic things, like the, the effects of the rain, the effects of the leg, just those really basic things that he was taught in breaking in? How much of that does he know? And on the ground, does he know, for example, without moving your feet, if you use lead rein pressure to lead forward or to stop him or to step him back? If you don't move your feet, you just stay in the one place. Can you do a step forward and a step back? And all of those things tell you what he knows about stop and go. And that's the heartland of problems. So if problems arise, you nearly always see it 
in, embedded in those kinds of really basic responses. Doing, I've just finished a, a, a book called Modern Horse Training, which I published just before Equitana. So if anybody's interested in that, I've, um, yeah, I'll put the link in the show notes. Yeah, but um, it's really it, it's really going back to more in a basic way of thinking, keeping it simple and thinking from the horse's perspective. It looks really complicated in the most incredible performances, but it still you, it goes back to training an animal that doesn't reason and how do you teach him the associations between all the aids and cues that you want. So just reflecting on how we use the pressures and the timing of release and the timing of everything we do is the key. Uh, I think that's important and the second thing I'd say is if we possibly can try to give the horse as much social contact as you can, remove the bars if you can so they can touch each other or a portion of the bars so they can choose to groom if they want to. It makes for a much, much more mentally balanced animal. Yeah. No thanks. Thanks so much for those tips and probably finishing off from a summary of what we have discussed is you can influence also their behaviour and mental health through a good nutrition profile that includes sufficient fat and fibre and not that overload of sugar and starch. I think that's a a big conclusion we can make from everything we see anecdotally and also the evidence presented in science. When I was researching also, Andrew, I had a um, a sort of inspirational quote that that was one of your favourites. I'm going to say it to see if it is the one. Kindness is a language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Yeah, that is one of my favourite quotes. I think it's a, um, it's really kind of the core of all of our interactions and remembering that, you know, the horse is a sentient animal. There's no doubt about that. And we need to think of the horse as a horse, not as a sentient human being, but as a sentient animal. And therefore, what are his needs, including you know, training, socialization and foraging and nutrition. You know, what, what, is he, what are his needs? And his needs are definitely not loads and loads of carbohydrate. That just makes him like a hyped up child <laughs> on sugar. Yep. And, you know, we suffer the consequences. Horses are very dangerous animals. Uh, I think they're the most dangerous animal in the Western world. In fact, something like one in every 350 hours of contact is, um, re- results in a serious injury that requires hospitalisation. That's the statistic. So I think it was still it's one death for every million head of population throughout the Western world. So it's, um, you know, we need to think for our own safety as well as the horse's welfare, how we interact with him. And so just thinking of those things like his nutrition, foraging, training and socialisation, we will go a long way if we get those right. It's absolutely well said, and I 100% or 150% echo those thoughts. And I think we will leave it at that for this one, but I don't think this will be the last time you'll be hearing from Dr. Andrew on our Send Nutrition podcast. Um, I thank you so much for our, for your time, Andrew. And how will people reach you? Well, even if they can't remember my website, uh, which is Equitation Science International www.esi-education.com If they just look up Andrew McLean Horse yep. or if they're interested to donate to the Well Elephant Charity it's Andrew McLean Elephant but this is about horses so I should not talk about yeah. elephants too much <laughs> but pretty much Andrew McLean Horse will lead to my my uh, website I think yep. yep that's all good I'll put the links in the show notes for anyone that wants to deep dive further so thanks so much for your time Dr. Andrew, and we wish you all the best in, in the future and we will have another update with you maybe in the in the new year. Yeah, no worries. I, I enjoy talking about it and helping people do the journey that I've been on. So, yeah, thank you very much for showing the intelligence and interest to pursue it. No worries, Dr. Andrew. We thank you for your time. We're grateful and appreciative of the information you've provided our listeners and We aligned in very similar values for the betterment of horse health, not only in nutrition, but also training. And we hope everyone has got a little bit of information that we didn't know about for a horse out of this podcast. 
So now I'll just introduce a nice little bonus segment, which deep dives into Dr. Andrew's work with elephants for anyone interested. So I'll play the recording now and just a word of warning, some of the descriptions of the elephant training may be a bit confronting. So yeah, that's just a little bit of a warning and I'll play the recording. As I did my research with you, I have noticed that you have transferred your knowledge to elephants and the link to the charity also to support this work. Um, if you want to elaborate on that, Dr. Andrew. Yeah, um, that was a pretty fascinating twist in my life that was totally unexpected. I had done a little bit of work in the early days during my PhD, actually, uh, through Angus Martin at the at Melbourne Zoo with the, whole, with the elephant, sorry, that didn't want to pick up his foot for veterinary treatment. So I was helping there, and you can't get in with them because the elephant was aggressive. Um, but since then, uh, a colleague of mine who's worked with me in Asia with elephants has retrained him, and after that happened, we were able to get in, and this elephant was a you know was definitely trying to injure us before. So that was interesting. But that was the only really interaction I had with elephants. And so then in 2007, 2006, I was teaching in Helsinki, and I was doing a workshop on young horses. And um, a person came to me to my workshop, and she had been employed by the, uh, the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, and had been to Nepal. And she saw how they trained the elephants there, the young elephants, to break them in, where they basically tied them by the neck to a pole, so they stayed there all the time. And then they they even put smoke and fire around the pole a long way away, but you know, so it was all smoky and the elephants would become dehydrated and they didn't give them water for a long time. And then they would go in and they'd hit them with sticks and stab them with spears. And I'm not, I'm not over exaggerating at all. This is probably an under exaggeration, um, understatement. They really stabbed them. And, um, and it's, and then they, they wonder why the elephants, on the, the next stage of breaking in is when they're really weakened, they don't fight back, and that's what they're looking for, an elephant that doesn't fight back. And so now these elephants will tolerate anything. So you then drag the elephant between two older elephants with a rope around its neck, and people and a guy gets on and starts doing the, the actions for stop and go with his legs, you know, just like a horse in an elephant, your toes on the ears. The base of the ears is your go button and your heels on your shoulder blades is your stop button and your toes on one ear is your turn button. And and that is the same all across Asia. Slight different places where they use their toes um, and, and heels, but same same basic pattern. And then I started to so – so she said, would you be interested to come to Nepal and, you know, develop a more humane program? And I said, well, I would, but I've never actually – you know, been uh, working with elephants except for this one at the Melbourne Zoo years ago, and that wasn't much. And um, but I'd be happy to do it. So off I went to Nepal, and, and it was to break in elephants. So I basically took the Jeffrey method with me uh, that we use for horses, and crossed out the horse and replaced it with elephant in the document, mm. and and it worked. And um, it really and and we used a lot of positive reinforcement because. That's uh, elephants are very, they're like big Labradors, they love food. So they're really easy to train with food. So we're using a mixture of pressure release and, and food training. And, um, and it was really successful. So we kept going back every year. And then uh, myself and Laurie Pond, a trainer, he's now at Australia Zoo. Um, he and I decided to set up our own foundation here in Australia called the HELP Foundation, which is HELP means Human Elephant Learning Programs. And um, we've now got a very strong board and we've been not only going to Nepal, um, but also uh, India. And we worked in the north and south of India. We're doing elephant breaking in workshops there because the elephants were uh, ridden there for uh, anti-poaching. And especially in the north, poaching is rife, uh, um, particularly from China, going taking elephants across the border. And there are... There's only 40-odd thousand uh, Asian elephants left in the world. There are mm. 450 African elephants, so they're pretty endangered. And so all anti-poaching is sort of really 
important and the elephant's the best vehicle to catch poachers on because they're quiet and they go everywhere and you've got a good high vantage point and you don't disturb the wildlife. So um, that's what we're using the elephants for then training. That's really wonderful. That's not uh, been an ongoing thing. And then the head of the, um, the Secretary General of I4, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, who is also the head of the Wildlife Trust of India, um, I said to him that I was going to write a book now that I knew enough about elephant training to just make a more humane method. And the Wildlife Trust of India supported that and actually the Minister of Conservation um, uh, g- gave me a book launching ceremony in Kerala, which was oh. kind of fun. And then... Um, because it was so effective in India, because in those two places in Assam in the north and Kerala in the south, all the nearby places that had elephants, nearby states, they came along as well. So we pretty much covered a lot of the elephant world in India. So and then, of course, Thailand wanted to do it, but Thailand's Indian elephants were more used for tourism. And, um, and tour- riding elephants has gone down the gurgler in Thailand, but they still want elephants to be trained on the ground for interaction with tourists, which is still pretty big. And and developing a lot of eco-tourism types of places where you can go and just see elephants do their thing without much interaction. And um, but you still have to trim their feet, and you know they still need veterinary care, so they need some handling. So that's the work I've been doing there, and also in the veterinary hospital in Lampang teaching the vets how to use positive reinforcement for dealing with um, eye ointments when the elephants resisted that or any other interaction because normally they had to chain them instead of, whereas this way you could do it easily. And then we went to Laos and Myanmar as well. So we covered, so now we're developing an app um, using, we've got about 94 animations from a really amazing animator from uh, from RMIT and graduate who did it for nothing uh, through RMIT, which was a really wonderful gift. Um, and we're turning that into an app, and we're going to roll that out this coming year in 2023 when we go back to resume our training. Wow, this is a fantastic crossover. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing. Um, and we're the only company as well, which is pretty interesting, that work in direct contact with elephants. All of the other um, training companies use protected contact, so they use sticks um, with, you know, target sticks with the elephant on the other side of a pen, and they think I'm a complete lunatic working with the elephant underneath it. But it's really, it's really so safe. I've done it so many times um, in so many different countries now, and all the staff I have are really good at it too. We've got. Uh, We've got a sort of stable of three trainers that come with us. And um, it's quite a learning curve for them, but they're really good at it. And um, we work directly with the elephant. And the reason that it is successful and it isn't dangerous is because we teach just the most simple thing first and then reward the elephant heavily for doing it. And once you do that, they're on your side. So the most dangerous part is just the first two minutes. (laughs) And then not not at all. Scanning the trust. Yeah, they really get to like it, and they're so much fun to to train because they, 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 you know, we teach them to do ridiculous things with positive reinforcement, like pick up the hat, your hat, and put it back on your head, and they kind of do it in a very messy kind of way, and you get covered in saliva and stuff. But it's it's pretty it's pretty good fun, and um, and you really see it. So, you know, and they have such amazing memories in a place called Bardia in the southwest of. Nepal, which you've got to get there by jeep through rivers and God knows what. It's a really amazing national park. Um, when I was training elephants there, I had five males that I was training, all young ones from age of uh, between three and five years of age. And um, and they remembered me year after year coming back. It was uh, you know quite a celebration for them because they get so vocal and they wrap their trunk around your neck and they, they always think I've got some food on me somewhere along the line. But we never feed them with the food in the trunk. We only ever feed them in the mouth because if you feed them through the trunk, next thing the trunk frisks you all the time. Oh, uh, yep. 
<laughs> no, that's that's so fascinating.